All right. Hey, good morning to you. It's a Tuesday. Man, if you got up early today, I uh, hope you got a chance to see that blood moon. It was totally amazing. Pulled the binoculars out and <clears throat> looked at that thing. <clears throat> just just amazing how how creation is and, and to see everything line up and to see that blood moon, totally amazing. So uh, creation is is incredible, and I hope you got a chance to see that. Uh, it is election day here in America, so I uh, hope you go out and vote and uh, do that thing. So uh, we are, and that's where Tammy is today. She won't be showing her little face on here uh, today because she's uh, working the polls. So they, they had to be there at 6, and uh, she'll be there all day loving on people and making sure they exercise their uh, right to vote. So that's what's going on in our world, and uh, man, I'm looking forward to jumping into some truth today. This is, uh, man, this is just rich. Um, I, I'm loving this study in John, and so um, you remember that John, the reason why he wrote this book, he says, I write this, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, uh, and that by believing in his name, you may have life eternal. And so that's the purpose the behind why he's writing what he writes. And so he's very specific in the stories that he tells. <clears throat> he is demonstrating that Jesus is God. If there's ever a book <clears throat> that you want to read to encourage you in that, uh, listen, there's a, the whole world right now, it seems like, uh, the ex-evangelicals, deconstructionists, uh, progressives, uh, post-Christian, whatever you want to call all these people that they have entitled themselves by these names, um, and they they uh, love to say that there's no proof. And I'm just telling you, if you look at the Gospel of John and realize this was a, a simple fisherman who uh, was a student of John the Baptist who met the Messiah, followed him, and now writes about the things that he told. He wasn't trying to be famous. If anything, it was dangerous to write what he wrote. Uh, he didn't do this because he thought, well, I'm just going to get my name out there and I'm going to become this great uh, you know, known writer, theologian, or whatever. Uh, he wrote what he saw, and, and he, he's very specific about that. And so he told us who Jesus was. He's done that from the beginning. He, he pre-existed creation. In the beginning was the Word. He coexisted with God, and the Word was God, uh, or, or was with God, and the Word was God, meaning that He's self-existent. He is He is uh, God Himself, fully encapsulated in um, in in Him within Himself, and that He is the light of the world, and um, that uh, that's what we find. Right? He is life, and He is light. And then we began to see the testimony of John the Baptist of what he said about him. And then we saw the five disciples that he has met so far and what they have to say about him. And then we journeyed uh, to uh, Cana for a wedding feast. Kind of a, a small crowd, right? I mean, in, in comparison to things, it's a small crowd. It's a family gathering and, and friends. And Jesus is among them because he lives in that town and he's been there for 30 years and Nazareth and Cana, they're, they're right together. And so he does the first miracle there. And we looked at that yesterday. Now, uh, then it says in verse 12 of chapter 2 that after this, he went down to Capernaum. And Capernaum is about eh, 16 miles away uh, from Nazareth and Cana and all of that. Uh, and so he's hanging out there. He's with his family. Uh, so it says his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Now, we know from history of reading the other texts that his brothers weren't believers in him yet. Uh, now, Jude and James and, and others will come to believe in him, but they don't. They kind of think he's crazy when he begins this ministry here. Uh, and his mother will even go through a doubting phase uh, in one of the passages of the scriptures that, that we could go to and look at. But he's among his family and his disciples. So his five, could be six, John, uh, James could be there among them now. We don't know. We know John and James are close because they're brothers and Peter and Andrew. And they're all fishing buddies. All of them, really. All of the ones so far that, that are following him come from fishing villages, most certainly <clears throat> that's the industry in which they find themselves, whether they're fishermen or they sell things to the fishermen. For the most part, that's who these guys are. Now, um, so that's where they are. Now, it says, uh, so they're there a few days, and then the Passover of the Jews was near. 
And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, this is this is um, the second. I mean, I think it's almost miraculous what took place because here's one lone man that is going to confront thousands of people, and not one are going to be able to stop him from accomplishing his mission. That in itself seems to me to be somewhat rather um, miraculous. And so we'll see this story unfold. Um, <clears throat> it's Passover. Now, uh, Josephus, a uh, historian of those days, not a Christ follower, just a Jewish historian, said there'd be a couple of hundred thousand, 250,000 um, uh, animals that would be sacrificed during this um, during this Passover time. The city would swell to somewhere between two million, two and a half million. So we're talking about a lot of folk. We're not talking about family and friends like what happened in in Cana. This is a big scenario that's taking place, and the Passover uh, as as this happened. It, it obviously you remember the Passover and where it comes from, right? Uh, there in Egypt, it's the tenth plague. God tells His people take a lamb, sacrifice it, take the blood of that lamb with a hyssop branch, uh, cover your doorpost, put yourself inside that home because I'm about to send the death angel through the town, and when he sees the blood on the doorpost, he will pass over you and spare you from losing your firstborn. Right, so we know that story, and so they have that has been their story down through the ages, and they've celebrated Passover, and so they would yearly bring their sacrifice, depending on their uh, affordability, could be doves, could be uh, you know uh, lambs, could be whatever it was that they would bring, and there would be this sacrifice, and the sacrifice would be sometime between three and six. Uh, in the afternoon, which coincidentally is when Jesus was on the cross dying. Um, and so there would be these animals everywhere, right? Uh, <clears throat> and and there's just a flurry of activity. And it had turned into somewhat of a, of a circus, uh, more of a tradition than it was a, a sense of reverence, right? I mean, in the, during the Passover, they weren't celebrating. They were fearing of, of a holy God who was bringing judgment on the land of Egypt. And so they uh, cover the blood of the door <laughs> over their doorpost, and then they eat a meal almost like they were <laughs> on the go because they knew that this was going to be the last the last deal and they were heading out. This was gonna this was what freed them and brought them to the, the promised land potentially. And so this is what's going on. And, and so Passover here, though, had turned into uh, a rather much of a circus. And it had been that way for a long time. Listen, before we jump into this, because this is the cleansing of the temple, uh, but he's at Passover. Listen to what, um, what Isaiah has to say. God encourages him to write this. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your many sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and fattened cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courtyard? Why are you coming in here like this? He's speaking of the temple. Do not go on bringing your worthless offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the proclamation of assembly. I can't endure wrongdoing in the festival of assembly. I, you, you just, you're just making a mockery of this thing God is saying. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I don't even want to show up at these things that you think you're celebrating me in the process. I'm tired of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I I'm going to hide my eyes from you. Remember, it's a house of prayer. They would go there and pray repentance and, and they would offer their sacrifice. This was what the intent of this was. Yeah, even though you offer me many prayers, I, I, I won't be listening. Your hands are covered with blood. You You just... You're heathens. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove any evil of your deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Obtain justice for the orphan. Plead for the widow's case. Come now and let us debate your case, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall become as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. 
And so we see in this story that's about to unfold in Jesus cleansing the temple, kind of the scenario of what's going on. This is what God thinks of this temple. They're doing all these sacrifices, but it's just a game to them. And he's like, man, I'm so tired of this. Now, Jesus is actually going to cleanse the temple two times. He's going to do it at the beginning of his ministry, which is this Passover here, and he will do it at the end of his ministry, the Passover in which he gives his own life and becomes the true sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God. And he is now about his father's business. His public ministry has happened, right? He he came out uh, and was baptized. That's when God uh, you know, said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is when the Spirit of Christ fell on him, the, the dove, the Spirit, Holy Spirit. He goes out into the wilderness, tempted by Satan, comes back, uh, goes to the wedding feast, and that's when he goes, hey, woman, why, what am I, why am I doing this? Right? And, she's, and, and that's when we realize he's about, he, he, there's a transformation now. He's, he's no longer mom and, and all of that. He's about his father's business. And so this is where he is now, and he's about his father's business. There's about one, two, two and a half million people in Jerusalem at this point. Animal sacrifices, uh, it's, he calls it a den of thieves. Uh, that's what he refers to, I think in Matthew he calls it that. It's just a business. There's not any repentance going on. There's no uh, reverence. It, it's just a marketplace. I want you to get this picture. This is a huge temple. Herod built this. It's this it's this incredible temple. Solomon's temple was torn down 500-something B.C. Um, and so this temple has been being uh, built and renovated for 40-something years. Uh, there is uh, the, the Roman uh, soldier station is adjacent to it. If you remember in Acts when, when Paul walked through the temple and they began to accuse him and, and, uh, and, and began to beat him, the soldiers came running down the stairs into the temple, dragging him back up the stairs uh, into the garrisons. And so it, there's all of this going on, this, this taking place. Now, let's just read the scene because it's quite amazing. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And within the temple grounds, he found those who were selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the table. So listen, you got a groundswell of people. They're not going to carry their animals thousands of miles uh, you know, to get to, to Passover. I mean, it would just be this kind of, of deal. So when you got there, you could buy an, an animal. And so it's a it's a racket. It's like going to the circus, man. They're always selling you little light laser things and everything else. It's just it's just trinkets. And so you've got people out there, and they're they're exchanging money because you came from a different land. And so there's the money changing that, that's going on, so you can have the right currency to go buy the animals that you need to buy for the sacrifice. And so they're busy doing that. Uh, it's just a it's a circus. And you might have brought your own. But there's going to be an inspector there who's going to say, that one's a blemished one. You can't have that. But, hey, I can sell you this one. I'll take yours little on the dollar. You have to buy this one. So there would be that exchange. They would take that lamb. Maybe it had a blemish on it. They would, they would hide the blemish, throw it in there with the pen with all their others, and then they would cycle those cells around. It was, it was a total racket. A den of thieves is what he calls it. And so Jesus sees this, and he knows this already because he's omniscient and because he existed uh, before all of this took place. And he watched uh, with God what was going on uh, in the temple in Isaiah's day. And so it says, and he made, so he walks in, he sees all that going on. He picks up some of the cords from some of the animals that, you know, they would have unleashed and done some things. So there's cords laying around. So, and he made a whip of cords and he begins to drive them all out of the temple area. So in this big court of the Gentile, this area where all of this is going on, he just goes about his business of taking his uh, these cords, weaving them into a scourge, and then he now he's this is this is the wrath of the Lamb, right? He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But John later will refer to him when in the second coming, when real judgment comes, he will call it the wrath of the Lamb. And so they're seeing a foretaste of what is to come in this judgment. And if judgment is to begin, where does it begin? In the house of the Lord. So Jesus is beginning the judgment. Uh, that that the that the Messiah will bring right now to bear in this temple, and so this is what's going on. Now let's read it together. 
And so he drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and the oxen. So all the people had these pins, man. He's just like, he's just running them out. He's got this whip and he's hitting the animals and they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're running and they're scooting and they're taking off. And, and, and so, you know, they're, they're, uh, uh, shepherds and all that, you know, the guys who they're, they're chasing after him, trying to collect their animals. They're like, what's going on? This man's just like going crazy here. Uh, he poured out the coins of the money changers. So he goes to that table where they're exchanging money. And there's probably several because, you know, you're exchanging whatever monies that, that are coming from different countries. And all of a sudden he just, he just pulls it, grabs that coin stuff, tosses it everywhere, overturns the tables. And to those who are selling the doves, he said, take these things away from here. Stop making my father's house a place of business. And so these crates, he's, he's you know, with the, with the doves, he's saying, get these things out of here. He's picking them up and shoving them into the hands of the people who are doing this. And, and, and no one has stopped him. Now, there would have been temple forces there. 300, I think, is what Josephus says there was. There's the if the if the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, who always keep an eye on these things because they don't, they're always putting down these things. Uh, if there was this activity, they they should be running down. Uh, Pharisees, said the Sanhedrin, it's all there. Everybody there, all the dignitaries. It's a big party. Not one person is stopping him. Take these things away from here and stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it is written <clears throat> um, that um, that uh, remembered it was zeal. Zeal for your house will consume me. Psalm 69. So they remember David saying these things. Zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what? What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Now, nobody grabbed him and, and hauled him out of there. You'd think a couple of thugs would show up, grab him by both arms, and yank him out of there. But no, not, not him. He is God, very God. He is Messiah. He is the King of Kings. He is the anointed one. He is the one who will sit on the, on the throne of David. <clears throat> and whatever is going on here, supernatural or not, they, they, can't, uh, they can't stop him. And so here's what he says. By what authority do you do this? Who gives you? You're not a priest. You're not a rabbi that we know of. You're, you, we don't even know who you are. Now, they did know, right? I mean, they've all, people have already heard. I mean, they heard the water, the wine, all that. People are telling these stories. There's, there's things going on. Now, listen to what he says. Destroy this temple. In three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said to him, it took 46 years to build this temple, and yet you will raise it in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. See, the, 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 the prototype, the temple uh, that was made for earth so that man could come, and, and, the, and the Holy of Holies, a representative, a priest, could, could make amends for them and offer a sacrifice to appease God, and it would be a sacrifice they would do yearly. But there would come the temple that would live among us. He was self-contained. This temple, this God, uh, was 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 all encompassed. You you came to Him. He now by one sacrifice, we have been freed from our sins, and because of that, we have access to the holy of holies. I need no priest anymore, for He has become that priest, a once for all sin. The veil is torn in two. We have access. And he's saying, hey, destroy this temple, the true temple that's coming to, to mediate between God and man and satisfy the wrath of God once and for all. He had to destroy that. I'll rebuild it in three days. Listen, they didn't even know they were going to kill him yet, right? He knew, and he knew it'd be three days he'd be in the ground. This is powerful stuff uh, of, of, of demonstration that he is God. Now, <clears throat> it says, so, uh, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Uh, and so, so this is the powerful uh, culmination of everything that took place. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons why we, we, when we eat the Lord's Supper, we, it's the same thing. That's why Paul says, hey, man, don't eat in an unworthy manner. Don't do, don't do what you're doing, this celebration of the, of the blood of the lamb and the, and the bread, 
in an unworthy manner like, like they were doing in the temple. And that's the reason why we do that. <clears throat> but yet, yet he's not stopped. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is now the wrath of the Lamb and they see it fully done. What sign? Destroy this temple. And then let's, let's look at what happens in closing. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name as they observed his signs, which he was doing. Lots of miracles he was doing there. Not just this. We don't have them recorded here, but lots of things were going on. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them because he knew the hearts of all people. And because he did not need anyone to testify about, about mankind, for he knew himself what was in mankind. We'll come back to that one probably tomorrow. Lord bless you guys. Have a great day. Can't wait to see you in the morning. Go vote.